Happy High and Holy Solemnity of the Super Bowl. <laughs> of course, we mock this. Today we celebrate the sixth Sunday in ordinary time, but a lot of times we prioritize these different gatherings, and especially this day that comes in February every year, possibly if the NFL determines it may be um, conflicting with March because they keep an, uh, adding game upon game upon game for, inter for revenue and for purposes of gathering money, of course. However, I don't know if it started with a Super Bowl commercial, but there's one advertisement that applies to our uh, Holy Scriptures today, and it's one that they put out, Capital One put out, and the slogan, as you already know, is what's in your wallet. Well, Capital One and Samuel L. Jackson say to you, what's in your wallet? I tell you today, what's in your spiritual wallet? What is it exactly that is in your bank account? What is it that you have a deposit of in your life? For us as Catholics, what's supposed to be in your spiritual wallet is the deposit of faith. So what is in your spiritual wallet? What have you prioritized in your life? What is it that you take in each and every day and deposit into that spiritual life that each one of us has through what Christ has done for us. So St. Paul tells the Ephesians, he says, say only the things men need to hear, things that will give grace to those who hear, things that will really help them. For many of us, this isn't true. We take things in. We play with the deposit of faith. We listen or we watch or we say, or assimilate the different opinions of people throughout the world through whatever means. Social media, the books we read, the movies we watch, the TV we're watching, the things we talk about, the things we gossip about. Do we really take St. Paul's exhortation, say only the things men need to hear, things that will really help them, things that pertain to the deposit of faith, not just the things about the faith? the things that pertain to the deposit of faith versus things about the faith. Because there's many, 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 many of us Catholics that get dissuaded, whether we're on one side of the church or the other, which there's no sides. If you're in the church, you're in the church. You believe what the church teaches. But some people subdivide. Some people sub subdivide even certain segments of the church and say, I'm a radical Catholic or I'm a liberal Catholic or I subscribe to Pope Francis or Pope John Paul II or Pope Benedict. We subdivide the church in these different camps as if they were dictators or as if they were presidents who ruled and enacted laws and policies that were their own. Don't forget that the Catholic Church has been around before any of these men existed, before Father Andy existed, and yes, even before Father Jim Costigan existed. The deposit of faith is something that is perennial. This is what connects us to the apostles. This is where we get the apostolic succession. This is why you're baptized, confirmed, have holy, receive Holy Communion, because it's the connection that we have in the teachings of the church that connect us to Christ, who told the apostles, he who hears you, hears me. And even St. Basil the Great, early in the church, one of the great apostolic fathers, after studying many different uh, authors and different books, and even paganism for a while, he advises us Catholics, he says, you should follow the example of bees. The bees do not land upon every flower, nor do they endeavor to take everything from the flowers on which they pause their flight. Once they have taken enough for their purpose, they leave the rest. We too, if we are prudent, will draw from these authors we could even include things that we're taking in. We will draw from these different avenues what is appropriate, what is closest to the truth, and leave the rest. Just as we are careful to avoid the thorns when we are pulling a rose, so shall we take care to avoid what can hurt the soul when we try to get good out of such readings. Or as Father Andy is saying, 
out of whatever avenue you're learning your Catholic faith. The deposit of faith requires us to fulfill the law. Just as Jesus said, I don't come to abolish the law, but he comes to fulfill it. He is bringing the, light, the law to a higher order. The doctrines of Jesus are of eternal value to men of all times. That means that the teaching doesn't change. As the Second Vatican Council told us, it is the source of all saving truth and moral discipline. It means that the truth applies to the way we live, morality, the way that we seek truth in our lives and in our actions. And so this means that the church is teaching us to keep the truth of the faith in its fullness is essential for the salvation of mankind. For us Catholics in this generation, this means a lot. That to keep the faith in his fullness and how Christ has given it to us according to the magisterium, this is essential for the salvation of us who live in this time, in this age, in this generation. So we ask the question of ourselves, is the purity of the faith at risk by what I am taking in on a daily basis? Because history provides more and more evidence that a Christian can frequently be led astray even when he is pious and of sound doctrine, when that Christian listens to the grain of truth or the appearance of truth that all errors contain. The devil seduces us. Do not forget that. The devil seduces us by the grains of truth, by the appearance of truth, by people who tout themselves as Catholics but criticize the church in destructive ways, sowing seeds of doubt in your ears, in your mind, and ultimately in your heart. Because the relationship of the heart is where Christ lives. But they'll start with your ears, the sa that Satan will start with your mind in order to get to the heart. So prudence in reading, prudence in what we are taking in is the manifestation of fidelity to Christ's teaching. The faith is our greatest treasure, and we cannot ri run the risk of losing it or weakening it, weakening it by anything in this world. I'm fired up about this because I really think that this is what's destroying us as Catholics and not allowing us to be united as Catholics is because we don't know the faith. We're listening to the wrong people. Right now, right now, there is nothing that can be compared with the faith. It's taking on assaults because we are not defending it, because we are not standing up as Catholics, because we are not searching the scriptures, being rooted in sound doctrine, but letting other people seduce us, letting other people's opinions of the church and what's going on in the church afflict our mind and our heart. This truth, the deposit of faith, this truth, this treasure, that each generation receives from the hands of the church. The church keeps it faithfully under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and has authority to authentically interpret it. So St. Paul VI said, when we accept the faith which the church proposes, we communicate, communicate directly with the apostles. And through them, we communicate directly with Jesus Christ, the first and only teacher. We go to their school, as it were, and overcome the distance of centuries that separate us from them. It's like going back to the future. I'm connected, connected to Christ through the apostles. And what truth is there in this world that can save us? What truth is there other than the truth of Christ? What is the new truth that could be of any interest to us? even if it sprang up from the wisest of men. If it dares to interpret, alter, or accommodate the divine word to suit his own whims, her own whims, it's not the truth. This is why the Lord tells us today, whoever then relaxes as much as one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so, by the way, that word teaches men to do so, comes from the Greek word scandalon, 
sounds familiar, scandal, causes scandal to men. When they teach these commandments and change them, they shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. They are threatening the salvation of their souls. So we have to be watchful of this, have to be watchful not only for ourselves, but for others. Jesus juxtaposes that teaching or accommodation of teaching with those who actually teach the word of God, teach the commandments. You are empowering the little ones to be on guard as well, to fight the good fight, to run the race. You teach the least of these commandments to your kids, to your pupils, to the people around you. You are called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So that's why today's responsorial psalm is critical. They are happy whose life is blameless, who follow God's law. They are happy to do his will, seeking him with all their hearts. So the psalmist says, teach me the demands of your statutes, O Lord. Train me to observe your law. St. Paul tells Timothy, the church is the pillar and bulwark of truth. So we cannot give it away for even little things, even though we may be inclined to compromise under the guise of tolerance. St. Jose Maria Escriva has this great line. Okay, ready? St. Jose Maria Escriva says, you are afraid of hurting people, of creating divisions, and of giving the appearance of being intolerant. And you are giving in on certain positions and certain points, though you assure me they are not serious ones, which will have fateful consequences for many. You are giving in, giving in on certain positions and certain points, though you assure me they're small, which will have fateful consequences to many. He says, forgive my sincerity, Forgive my truth-telling. Through your behavior, you are following, falling into nothing less than stupid and harmful intolerance that you were concerned to avoid, that of not allowing the truth to be proclaimed. We are guilty of intolerance by being intolerant, by not telling the truth, by not giving the truth, letting the truth be proclaimed. Proclaiming the truth is often the greatest good we can do for those who surround us. If you want to take something in your wallet, take that. Proclaim the truth when convenient and inconvenient. This is important because for the sake of tolerance, we've compromised. Whether it's in my little life, within my community life, within my moral life, I'm looking for loopholes. I'm looking to shoot the gap. I'm looking like a running back trying to get through the line so I can get a touchdown and get as much as I can get. It's not true. I'm compromising. St. Paul exhorted St. Timothy. He said, guard what has been entrusted to you. Avoid the godless chatter and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have altogether missed the mark as regards the faith. Be on guard against false teachings. Be on guard against false truth. Because what we have is what is in your spiritual wallet, the deposit of faith. It's the unalterable content of the faith that the church has received down through the centuries. It's to designate the truth received by Christ in which the church is charged to preserve until the end of time. That's where the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Guess what? In that analogy, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We're not passive. We're not the ones held up in some castle having a gate to block us. Listen again, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. That means we're on offense. We're not on defense. We're on offense. We are bursting the gates of hell as Jesus did before us. We are breaking down sin and death and that false teaching because of Christ who lives in us. That's the deposit of faith. That's the truth of this faith that does not change with the passage of time. 
It is not superseded or modified or overtaken by the course of history. It doesn't matter what age we live in. The deposit of faith, the truths of the faith, what Christ has passed down doesn't change. It does allow fresh insights or even calls for a pedagogical and pastoral requirement to speak to the children of this age, those who are yoked to the world, the flesh, and the devil. It takes ingenuity. It takes creativity. Taking the words of Christ and saying, this is how it applies to you. This is how it applies to me. That can change. The world changes. We adapt. We improvise. But we're still on offense. We are still attacking. We are still defending that truth. And so sometimes it's appropriate to the characteristics of my life to teach the faith to the people in my sphere of influence. It takes insights. It takes pastoral creativity. It takes different ways of dealing with people because people are different. People are complicated. But the truth is simple. And so what has been believed everywhere, always, and by everyone in our Catholic faith that must be preserved as the deposit of faith. So a Christian, the Christian, freed from the tyranny of sin, is encouraged by Christ, this new law, the fulfillment of law, to behave as a child in the presence of his father. That means that the moral norms, the way that I live my life, are not merely indicators showing the limits of what's allowed and what's forbidden. Father, how close can I get to sin before I get burned? Father, how far is too far? Father, how far can I go before I fall into sin? We're asking the wrong question because it's not about what's allowed and what's forgiven. These moral truths that Christ gives to us, they reveal the pathway that leads back to God. They're signs of his love for us. And if we don't accept them on that level, the heart level, the love level, then they'll just be best practices. They'll just be dissolvable rules. But they're not that. They've never been that, and they never will be that. Christ has told us that out of love, he lays down his life for us. So we ought to know those thoroughly, know thoroughly those groups of truths and the precepts that make up the deposit of faith, the non-negotiables, the foundation of the church. This is the treasure that God has given to us through the church that must be saved that those who believe must believe in, in order to be saved. So that wealth of truth is protected primarily for each one of us by piety. What do I mean by piety? It means prayer and the sacraments. If we're staying away from the sacraments, if we're keeping our kids away from the sacraments, if we're not praying and we're not letting our kids pray, it's not defended on the first level. Also, by serious doctrinal formation, we call that catechesis. If you're not growing in your knowledge of the faith, you're growing outside of the faith. You're growing in people's opinions. You're growing in YouTube followers and YouTube subscribers, watching blog posts and waiting for the next notification. God's already notified you enough. You don't need your phone to tell you. He's notified you and continues to notify you with his holy scriptures with the catechism of the Catholic Church, with the deposit of faith. And this doctrinal formation leads me and le leads each one of us to exercise prudence in what we're taking in, what we're taking into our minds and our hearts. What is it that I'm digesting? What is it that I'm keeping in my wallet for a rainy day? It better be the deposit of faith, otherwise your money is no good here. It's like cryptocurrency can dissolve like that. The natural law which, which is written on our hearts by God, the natural law written by God on my heart and yours, leads me to hold in high esteem these gifts of heaven, the treasures of the deposit of faith. So for each one of us, for each one of us to place our faith in danger voluntarily, 
by reading harmful books or entertaining ourselves with content that is contrary to the Catholic teachings, supporting anti-Catholic endeavors, teaching little ones to disregard the church, that leads us to sinful actions. Whether you're the president, a Catholic, whether you're a Christian, whether you're anybody made in the image and likeness of God, we are liable, liable to Gehenna. Period. Because we're not taking God's commandments. We are not believing him in the fullness of his faith, the faith he has passed down to us. It doesn't matter who we are. If we call ourselves Catholic, we have to hold these commandments in their fullness, hold the deposit of faith. And like a bee, take what is appropriate and leave the rest. You have to save your own soul before you can even save your husbands, your wives, your kids, the president, the pope, the bishop, Father Andy, Father David, the novices, the postulants. Obviously, the postulants are kind of innocent. They just got here, so give them a break. But you have to save your own soul before you even think about them, before you even think about your spouse, before you even think about your kids. I know that's hard, moms, but that's true. The deposit of faith, know your faith, because there's an old adage, you can't give what you don't have. If I don't have the deposit of faith in my wallet, I can't give it to you. What's in your spiritual wallet? So are we taking into our lives things that breed those things that Jesus condemns in our Holy Gospel today? Are we lusting after a woman in our heart? because we're not committing adultery. I'm a good person, Father. I'm doing right things. Don't worry about me. I'm good. I'm nice. But Jesus says, even if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery already. Or if you breed unforgiveness, you breed resentful feelings, you breed grudges. Jesus says, you're liable to Gehenna liable to judgment, liable to the council, liable to Gehenna. Unforgiveness is terrible. And guess what? Jesus is going to reemphasize this next weekend. So get ready for that. That's part of the deposit of faith too. The unjust anger we have against our brother can lead us to hell very quickly. Or even adultery, as I said, or maybe even divorce divisions within our family, within our friends, within whatever. So what shall we do? Well, first, if you don't know the deposit of faith, seek good advice. Priests are priests for a reason. They're supposed to shepherd you. Take advantage of their time. Seek good advice. Seek spiritual counsel. Figure it out through advice. That's why one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is counsel. You're supposed to ask questions. You're supposed to be in doubt and ask clarifications. You're supposed to do this. But yeah, we don't. I don't understand. Well, I guess the football game's on, so. Huh? You can't be serious. No, you're not serious, because if you were serious about your Catholic faith, you'd ask questions. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to doubt. It's okay to ask clarifications. The apostles did it. They went right to Jesus and said, what do you mean by this parable, Lord? He explained it. Nobody can give you an answer if you don't ask the right questions or you don't seek it. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock at the door of the church and it will be open to you. Now, I know that's easy for me to say. Father, you're a priest. Believe me, there's plenty of times that I've doubted. Plenty of times I've asked questions. Plenty of times I've asked for clarifications. That's why seminary takes eight to ten years. Because you need this. You need to solidify your faith. Make sure it's on the rock, not on the sands of other people's opinions. So each one of us has to study in many areas, ask questions, seek the truth. So if we, for, if we remain faithful to Christ and we treasure our faith, we shall be steering clear of the superficial longing to be up to date 
on church politics, false doctrine, or juicy gossip, whether it's in the church or outside the church. We won't cling to who the president is or who the pope is. It's nice. It's nice. But my faith isn't in them. My faith is in Jesus Christ. So we need to be well-formed and solidified, faithful to the teachings of the gospel and the magisterium of the church. This will allow us to value everything, take in everything worthwhile in the aspects of this culture. Because there are good things. Don't let anybody tell you that. There are good things happening. You just won't see it on the news. And you won't see it on your favorite YouTube video. You got to look for it with the eyes of faith. You got to listen for it with the ears of faith. You have to speak about it so that others may see your light and glorify God. Not glorify you, glorify God. So we'll also, not only will you pick out what's worthwhile, you like the bee are gonna just leave the rest. You'll be able to pick out what's contrary to the Christian faith and turn a deaf ear to that one. Say only the things that men need to hear that will really help them. Hear that. So this is how many, many, many Christians and Catholics before us have lived their life. They have been humble. They have been prudent. They have had common sense. And we won't be like those people who take the poison that happens to be mingled with a little bit of honey. So as we come to communion today, let us thank God for the deposit of faith. Let us thank God for that grounding rod. Thank God for that spiritual deposit that's in your bank account and in your spiritual wallet. That deposit of faith that makes us unshakable as Catholics. That the world and the flesh and the devil are no match for. As we come to communion, Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity, which part of the deposit of faith, we believe he is truly, really, substantially present in the Holy Eucharist and that you and I are not worthy to approach his altar, but yet he says the word and we are healed. He says, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He says, take this, all of you. This is my body. This is my blood given up for you. Receive me because when you receive me, you receive the Heavenly Father. You receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is poured forth into our hearts. I'm quoting scripture. That's the deposit of faith. That's what uplifts us. That gives us life. And you can have no life if you do not eat his flesh and drink his blood. So this is a pivotal moment on this high holy day. On this high holy day of the Super Bowl, on this sixth Sunday in ordinary time, you are called to communion. You are called to unite Christ's body with yours. He is the source and summit of our faith. He is the perfecter of our faith, as it says in the book of Hebrews. So as we receive Jesus, let us ask our blessed mother, who is the seat of wisdom. She is the throne of God. Ask her for this gift of judgment in our study so that we, what we take into our daily lives, what we consume, what's in our spiritual wallet, let us ask her to teach us to esteem and love more and more these treasures of our faith. For we are rich. We are rich in that spiritual money, that spiritual treasure that Christ has given to us, that Christ has won for us now and forever.